Six years ago, I stood on the stage at TEDx Stellenbosch as a 27-year-old startup entrepreneur. And I said that I believed that we were wasting entrepreneurial talent in this country, especially in historically disadvantaged communities. And that if we could find a new way for identifying and investing in talent, we could have an enormous social impact, but also grow an amazing business. Six years on, I'm more convinced of that idea than I was when I said it in Stellenbosch. And I'm more committed to the idea of using entrepreneurship to build a more fair and equitable society than I have ever been. And so I've been thinking about why. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about. I'm going to start with the foundations. When I first started, I went to uh, people would ask me, why do you want to do this? And I would say, you know, I'm, I'm a committed South African. I'm patriotic. I love this country. And then people would take that for a second and then say, but no, but everyone in South Africa is patriotic. Why do you want to do this? And I would get annoyed at the idea that you keep asking why and why. It was good enough for me. But then I thought, okay, let me listen. Let me start asking. And the reason really came down to, well, two reasons. The first is this uh, blonde, blue-eyed, uh, tigress of a, of a woman over here on the left, this little Welsh lady, uh, who's my mom. <laughs> and on the right, this jocular, uh, outgoing, empathetic Indian man from South Africa, who's my dad. And my dad, when he was 17, decided he, he wanted to become a doctor, and he looked at the then Transvaal, and he said, there's only three Indi Indian medical students here. I don't think I have the best shot of becoming a doctor if I stay. So he went to the UK, and he was in the UK for 18 years. And he met my mum, and he became a doctor. And my mum grew up in small town England. She went to Cambridge. Um, but she met my dad, and they decided together that they wanted to contribute to the anti-apartheid struggle. And they were going to come back. But when they were going to come back, the Mixed Marriages Act was still in place, the Immorality Act was still in place. And so to be a mixed-race couple was illegal. So they had me in 83. They got me a British passport in case anything happened to them. And they came back in 84. And my dad went and oversaw all the maternity wards in Soweto. And my mom came and oversaw uh, the maternity ward in Alex Clinic. And then beyond that, all they did was to provide, basically all they did, I think, was to provide medical services to the ANC and to any, any other institution that was involved in anti-apartheid struggle. And they did that throughout the 80s and into then well into the 90s. And what I took, what I take from their example, and why I'm so committed, and I think why I'm so committed to this idea, beyond being a patriotic South African, is threefold. The first is that you don't know who these people are. And part of why I like talking about them is because I feel like they need to be known. They didn't do it because of fame and fortune. They did it at great sacrifice to themselves because they thought it was the right thing to do. And for me, you know, I suppose especially in the age of social media, the willingness to sacrifice your real life, not just have an opinion about things, but the willingness to go and do something about it at cost to yourself, is critical to the integrity of your ideas. If you're not willing to sacrifice, then your ideas are really just theory and, and are a lot less credible. The second thing that I took from them was that while I felt privileged by the upbringing of being raised in, in a household where my parents, it was illegal for my parents to be married, I did feel like the state treated my family, family unfairly. And the fact that a state can tell people who love each other that you can't be married on the basis of a really arbitrary thing like race is unfair. And that made me, that makes, made me committed to the idea of a, a society which is an, an enabler. It's not about stopping people from doing the things that they want to do, but about enabling people to, do, to become the things that they have it within them to become. And the third thing was really about being a mixed race South African and you know, not having a race in a country which I think is still more obsessed with race than just about any country in the world. Um, and seeing how, how much of stereotyping and dismissal of people is based on ignorance. Because I would be with white people and see what they would say about Indian people. You know, be with my white friends sometimes and they'd be talking about my dad walking up to the group and feeling really uncomfortable, but knowing you don't know anything about these people. You don't know anything about this man. You shouldn't be saying things like that. And feeling the same when I was with my Indian family and hearing the things they would say about <laughs> everybody else. <laughs> and realizing how much of the ignorance and the stereotyping in this, in this country is to do exactly with, with exactly that. It's about ignorance. It's about not knowing the other as opposed to understanding the other and then having an opinion. 
And that's exactly what we do with talent in the country. We dismiss, we categorize and dismiss on the basis of race, on the basis of class, on the basis of gender, instead of really seeing what's at the core of somebody uh, and then deciding how best to support them. So that foundationally was why, is why I'm so committed to this, this mission that we have at our way to. Why I'm convinced by the idea, so we started. We started this company with 60,000 Rand and within about six months, we had, we first, we, we went into Alex, we got three entrepreneurs, and within six months, two of them had quit. We'd run out of money, and the guy who had come back to start Aweta with me had decided this was not for him, and he was going back to America. So I was by myself, basically, with one entrepreneur, and then this guy walked through the door, and this guy's name is Lasika Matlo, and he had heard me four months before on the radio, and I had no money, so we went on radio, got people pretty excited, and then basically started not, not answering phone calls and, <laughs> and, 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 and delaying things. Um, and Lasika, he moved from rural Northwest. He was an entrepreneur selling cigarettes in rural Northwest. He heard me on the radio saying we were looking for world-class entrepreneurial talent. And he moved from rural Northwest to Joburg to be part of Awetu. And when he got here, he couldn't, well, he'd get me on the phone and I'd say, please just hold on, please just hold on, and delay, delay for four months. He had to get a job, he got unemployed, he got a job again, he was sleeping on his friend's couch in Hillbrow, and eventually, on the day that he got a full-time job offer, I decided to go, okay, we may not have money, but we can still do things. I accepted him into our incubator, which to call it an incubator is probably overstating. It was me in a room, and he was accepted in. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember on that I was feeling incredibly, if you, you can think about that, I was 27, I put, decided that this was gonna be my life's work. Two of the entrepreneurs were gone, partner gone, run out of money, and then this guy comes and tells me this story. And I remember, I still remember the moment when he told me that what he had gone through because he wanted to be part of our way to, and I had to take myself into another room, just breathe, <laughs> compose myself, and go back uh, and run the selection process. Um, and so Lasika went on to start a tourism business, which at its peak was, employ was employing eight people and turned over a million bucks in that year. And because of what he did for me, he actually became one of my co-founders of Awetu. So the first three entrepreneurs in Awetu became my co-founders. And so now he's moved back to his village. He actually moved back at the end of last year and he's going into commercial farming. And he's a startup entrepreneur again. Um, but what I took from Lasika and why I wanted to tell you his story is because when I first said this talent, it was a very theoretical concept, right? It was just about, I, I literally had a, had a theory written on the slide about why there must be talent mathematically. What Lasika did was to make that real. And more than just about anyone showed me, he gave me an example of a human being who if we get the right resources in place, he would run with those resources. And it's not just, it's not about him, it's about the belief that there are thousands of people like that, tens of thousands of people like that in this country who if we make the resources available, will run. And you have to make the resources available because if you don't, if you don't make them available to the people who will create, the people who will take opportunity, then you create opportunity for the people who do not want to create, for the people who want to destroy. And that's a key reason why we have to get resources to people like Lasika, and why I'm convinced by this, this mission. So with Lasika's example, and with the examples of the three other co-founders, we, we raised a bit of money um, and we, we launched a, a much bigger incubator, which was actually an incubator, and we launched an investment fund. And we started to look at investments which were more than just micro-entrepreneurship, so we had an, um, the micro-incubator and then we started to look at much bigger investments, much bigger businesses. And one of the guys I c we were considering investing in was a friend of mine uh, who actually went to, I knew from high school, we were on junior council together uh, and he went to Witz, he was from Soweto, went to Witz, then he went off to um, Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, then he went to Harvard to do his MBA, and then he was at McKinsey. And he wanted to start a food services business, and he wanted to grow the biggest black-owned food business in the world, and we were considering investing in him. A world beater, this guy. I, I knew because I knew him at some of those institutions, and I knew his quality. And I was always fascinated to meet his parents, and I'd never met his parents, even though I'd known him from high school days. So when he was getting married, he invited me to his wedding, and I was excited for the wedding, but I was particularly excited 
to meet these parents that had produced this world beater. And so when I got there, he said, okay, yeah, I'd like you to meet my mom. And I turned around and I shook. I see this lady and I said, don't, don't I know you? And she said, yeah, you look familiar also. So we talked and she said she was running a business. I said, okay, well, let me get your number because we have an incubator, maybe we can help. I put a number in my phone and there, mom Lindy comes up. I already had her number because a year before she had graduated from our incubator and I had been oh, wow. struck by her then <laughs> as I was struck by her at the wedding, although I didn't know that she was my friend's mom. And why I love this story is because if my parents tell you why I wanted to do our way to and why I was, I'm committed to it, and the seeker tells you how, many pe how people feel and how they look when you give them opportunity, Mom Lindy shows, for me, what happens, what can be the impact when you get people those resources. So not only, so she was running, a, her and her husband ran a small shop and butchery in Soweto. So not only can you make the lives of the people you help on that micro scale better, but you can produce world beaters. You can produce world beaters who ultimately will make the lives of every generation to come in that family and then by their impact, everybody else that they impact, uh, they influence better by that small investment that you make. So with all of that said, we, you know, th with these stories and that, that commitment, we went from that 60,000 Rand that we started with, we now have uh, over 400 million Rand which we're investing in this mission of using entrepreneurship <coughs> to make this a more fair and equ equitable country. And we have, a, we have a strategic goal that in the next six years we want to raise 10 billion rand and invest in 10,000 entrepreneurs to really try to change the face of inequality in this country and the face of opportunity in this country. I'm, I'm confident that we can do that. I'm not sure that we can. It's, it's obviously a big ambition. Um, but what I do hope to have conveyed to you guys is why I'm so committed to that idea and why I'm so convinced that it's possible. Thanks. <coughs>